I don't think there is a more easy to read, concise, and unbelievable, quite frankly, story of us that I've ever read than the book The DNA of Democracy and the newest follow-up, Shadows of the Acropolis. Richard C. Lyons is the author of those books. Mr. Lyons, how are you, sir? I'm very good, Mike, and good to see you. You as well. I say unbelievable as a compliment because so many times when I'm reading DFA Democracy, I'm like, I, I would say that's not, there's no way that's true. Not, not even because it's unbelievable because I've never heard that before. It's like, how could I have never heard this before, ever? And then I'd look it up again and sure enough, you're 100% right and your analysis uh, was perfect. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, that's great. So a DNA of Democracy, please go buy the book. So we're talking about Native Americans in, uh, in this special here. Tell us a yeah. little bit about the clash of cultures, the clash of worldviews. How, how different was the white man coming to the new world and these, these savages who were already here? Well, there was a really un unique mix of things happening, both in America and in Europe. In, in England, you had the Puritans trying to escape uh, the tyranny of the Anglican Church after Henry VIII, uh, and the divine right of kings came along, and so they were told what they could and could not believe. And so they just, they wanted to be free, uh, and so ventured hostile seas to an unknown world, and there found uh, the Native Americans, who were as free as any people in human history because of the way they managed themselves. Their, their idea of government was the government that governs least means that you have the most freedom. Now later we'll get to how that played into actually being a negative, but it was one of their great virtues. So when the Puritans came over, they were actually far more strict than the Native Americans. But there was an interesting confluence of events. At the same time that pilgrims were entering the North American continent, their brethren back in Europe were discovering the ruins of Greece and Rome and the still existing constitutions, uh, not active constitutions, but they were in writing and could be read, the constitutions of, of Rome and Athens, for example, or Thebes or Sparta. And so here they came to the North American continent and found that there was a Iroquois league that had assemblies. In the assemblies, only those who were had merit could speak. They were the Sashas. They were those who did good works for their people. Those were they who were the most courageous. Uh, those were they who were the most productive in their tribes, whether they were of the Seneca or the Cayuga, uh, et cetera. And so there was a great confluence between the free peoples, uh, the example of the free peoples that were once in Europe and the free peoples in North America. And it graduated into the concept of the natural man and the idea of natural rights. And those natural rights are what formed our constitution and bill of rights. Okay, so th this is what your book is. It's, it's taking these historical moments and weaving them together. I've never heard anyone weave them together so well. And that should have been my first question is what historical thing was happening in the 1600s that, right. that shaped the worldview of these first settlers? So maybe if you could just well, that, accentuate that again. What, what were they coming out of? Yeah. Well, you had the movement of humanism. And, well, there was the printing press, there was humanism, and there was the exploration of the manner in which the Greeks and the Romans governed themselves, which was, variously, as democ direct democracies and in Rome, republics. So there's that example. In America, they were encountering the Confederacy of the Iroquois League. All those three elements merged into our constitution. From Athens we get the idea of local governance and the assembly, direct assembly, where everybody has a voice and a vote. From Rome we get the idea of representative government, which is in our federal government. From the Iroquois League we got the idea, reflected in the Federalist Papers, how, does, how do we manage to collectivize our defense while maintaining independence in our states and localities. So that confluence of events, that's what gave birth to our constitution. Yeah, that's amazing. 
So what's this balance of the, the white man comes and they see these backwards primitive savages who are scalping people, or do they see <laughs> these like, like amazingly enlightened, I can't believe these people live in such a prosperous, not prosperous, that's different, but in such a natural way. Yeah, I, I put it in the book that they were, they were so successful as arborists that they took just enough out of the wilderness to maintain the wilderness as it is. Mm. They, they lived within the earth, not upon it. And they had a very different conception, and this is where it came to conflict. The different conception about the, the earth cannot be owned. It gives, it gives the great spirits gifts to humanity, but cannot be owned. Like you, you cannot own the great spirit. The great basis of freedom from the European perspective was, in Europe, you were always subject to a landlord. You paid your rent to him all your life, but only his family owned the land. That's why you were subject to him or his family. John Locke, his philosophy came, which informed our uh, idea of property rights came up with the idea that if one owns one's own property, he has a basis to defend his own rights. So you have one people native to the North American continent who could not conceive of property rights spiritually, and another people coming over from Europe who had never in history owned land. Their families had always been subject to landowners, but then thought that their acreage, their little farm, right, was their fortress. It was the basis of their rights. It was every man being king of his castle. So that merged into our uh, idea of property rights. And again, John Locke's idea of individual rights, individuals being the sovereign, not the government, entails individuals having the right to property. Yes, yes, unbelievable. Okay. Tell, tell us about, you write about this in your book, it was, I think it was 1710, the, the four kings traveling over to England. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. And I just love this story because talk about a clash of cultures. Good night. I couldn't imagine being in England well, no, they, at this time. Actually, they were, they were so celebrated in England. This was the event in London. All the aristocracy from around uh, England came to London for this wondrous uh, show of this exotic people who everybody was thrilled to meet. And one of them, a, a key character was Canessa Tago. And so he was being, he was just walking through the streets of London and people were kind of, hey, you're the Native American we've all heard about. And a woman came up to him and said, well, you must be a king. Look at how beautifully you're dressed. Are you a king? Is that why you're here? And he said, we don't have kings uh, in our tribe. We have sashams. We gain our, uh, our position in our tribe by merit, not by birth. And neither do we consider that we should spend our entire lives laying around while we plunder the goods of our people. We don't pl plunder other people. We earn our own worth. And that was a revolutionary idea in England, and it just and it seeped through both the people of England, and it became part of the original American character, and gave birth. And this whole this whole milieu of of peoples coming together and the idea of the natural man created also uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration in France of the Rights of Man, and the French Revolution. When, they, when this example came from, a, from America for the Europeans to see, everyone in Europe said, well, why the hell are we servants to these people who lay around and spend their lives plundering us? They take all of our wealth and they use it to oppress us, right? They use it to fund the armies which oppress us. And so think of our revolution, Mike, when, when England took our taxes to fund a standing army in America, though we were not at war, and also funded the customs agents. So that is the perfect example, and I think it exists in America again today. When you give a, a government power, that kind of power, they take your taxes and use it to oppress you. 
just amazing to me to, that, that the natives gave us an example of what could be that was so influential on yes. our founding and our founding fathers and our founding grandfathers. Uh, Richard, Utterly I hate we have to run. To the but, American uh, character. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, by the books, everyone. DNA of democracy in the age of the Acropolis. It's all in there. By Richard C. Lyons and much more. Mr. Lyons, it's a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Great to see you again, Mike.